Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Electronics have gotten smaller and smaller, and they continue to do so every day, which of course has led to smaller and smaller satellites as well. And with these small satellites has emerged a whole flood of companies trying to launch small satellites on a more dedicated rocket. After all, sometimes less is more because it'd be pretty silly to pay for a rocket that has extra performance that you just don't need. Why would you have a semi truck deliver your pizza when a scooter will suffice? So today I wanted to do a comparison and a little overview of some of these key players in the small sat launch industry. With a handful of new launchers getting hardware out on the launch pad, launching and some of them even getting to orbit, I think now is a good time to give you a rundown on some of these exciting new rockets. So we'll do a quick little overview and a rundown of some of the features of Firefly's Alpha, Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1, Astra's rockets, Relativity Space's Terran 1 rocket, ABL's RS-1, and of course the current king of small sat launchers, Rocket Lab, with their Electron that has already launched 20 times. But small sat launchers aren't new, so we're also going to compare them all to the OG new space private small sat launcher, the Falcon 1, to see if the industry is catching up to what SpaceX was doing over 10 years ago. Okay, let's get started. Three, two, one, this video is brought to you by KiwiCo. All right, all right. Right off the bat, I have to make a confession. This isn't a complete list of small sat launchers currently flying or trying to fly because that list is this long. <laughs> so we had to make some cuts. I decided to make a rule. The company has to have either attempted to launch or at least have hardware out on the launch pad and targeting launching in 2021. I also wanted all of these rockets to be clean slate designs, not just repurposed hardware like some other launch vehicles. But of course that gets confusing because some of these launchers will be launching out of shipping containers off the back of a truck and it doesn't really matter where their launch pad is or like Pegasus, it's, it just gets a little bit confusing. So I promptly broke our rules and I just had to make some executive decisions. So sorry if your favorite launcher wasn't included in this rundown, but we still figure this was a big and comprehensive enough comparison for what might be flying by the end of 2021. We want hardware here, folks, not drawings, no paper rockets. And if you were expecting to see some of the private launchers from China on this list, unfortunately, we just really don't have a lot of info on them. And most of them are just rebranded military solid rocket boosters. So although some of them are really cool and hold a lot of promise, they didn't quite make it on this list. And we also are not including older systems like the Pegasus, because Pegasus could definitely fit a fair amount of these definitions, but it's expensive and it literally has no future in commercial space or really almost no future at all. It's pretty much done. So here's timestamps for each section and each rocket and the final big comparison for you guys. Now, of course, there's links to the timestamps in the description of this video. The YouTube play bar is broken up into these sections as well. And there's an article version of this video up at everydayastronaut.com for easy searching and references. So before we get into all of this new hardware, let's first define what a small sat launcher is and why they exist. A small sat launcher, or technically a small lift launch vehicle, is a class of rocket. So it's a rocket that's capable of taking up to 2000 kilograms to low earth orbit. Anything above 2000 kilograms to LEO is technically a medium lift launch vehicle, such as the Soyuz, the Proton, the Atlas V, or the Falcon 9. So obviously a small lift launcher isn't as capable as a bigger rocket, but they're not really supposed to be. With a large number of lightweight satellites that are being built and developed right now, there's plenty of demand for a rocket launcher that can take them directly to their destination. But you might be quick to think, why do these rockets even exist when the Falcon 9 is already one of the cheapest dollar per kilogram rockets ever made? Or will this all even matter when Starship is online? Well, first off, just like we mentioned in the intro, you wouldn't expect a pizza to be delivered by a semi-truck. Yes, of course, a semi-truck can carry a lot more and its dollar per kilogram of cargo is pretty cheap. 
but it's just simply not the best option for all payloads. It's a bit overkill. The same thing is true with airplanes. Cessnas still exist at the same time as jumbo jets. And even in the jetliner world, a small regional jet taking a few dozen passengers is a completely different need than flying hundreds of people across the ocean as efficiently as possible. Now there's countless examples of this, but at the end of the day, if you have a 200 kilogram satellite and you want to fly to a specific orbit, you could either pay say, 50 million-ish dollars for a Falcon 9, <laughs> or you could maybe pay about $5 million for a smaller rocket that will do the job no problem. Now, of course, ride sharing is an emerging option, but you're typically at a fairly limited launch cadence and destination. So sure, sometimes hopping on a bus in a big city and getting off a few blocks from your destination is just fine. But other times, you just want an Uber to take you right to your front door. Besides that, developing a massive rocket requires a lot more capital, and it carries with it a ton more risk. We're talking about development and investments in the billions for rockets like the Falcon Heavy, Starship, New Glenn, or Vulcan. So a brand new rocket company would probably be pretty silly to think they could just come out of the blue and sink billions of dollars into a huge rocket instead of starting with a smaller, less risky program that may only cost a few million dollars to get off the ground. Literally. Okay, so small lift launchers, cool. Now let's talk about a few of these and what makes them stand out in a sea of potential space Ubers. We're just going to briefly describe these rockets and then do a side-by-side -side comparison of their exact capabilities at the end. Now before we get into the official ones that we chose, I did have to touch on a few that are just too cool to not talk about, but they're probably not going to be flying in 2021, and I really hope we see them fly because some of these systems are just awesome. Orbex is working on a very unique rocket that we don't know a ton about called Prime. The things that make this rocket super unique besides launching from the UK is the fact that it has coaxial tanks. This means the fuel tanks housing liquid propane are actually inside the liquid oxygen tanks. They both run the length of the stage vertically, like a tube inside of a tube. The use of propane is key because when it's surrounded by cryogenic liquid oxygen, it doesn't freeze solid, it stays a liquid. Now we don't know a ton about the engines themselves or even what the first stage will look like other than they plan on it being reusable. But keep your eye out for Orbex. Another one that's gonna be flying from the UK is Skyrora with their Skyrora XL launch vehicle. This rocket will be pretty cool because of the same reason, it also uses coaxial tanks. I don't know what you guys across the pond are doing over there and what your love with coaxial tanks are, but I love it. Skyrora XL will run on high test peroxide or HTP for the oxidizer and RP1 for the fuel. It'll have nine Skyforce engines on its first stage and a single vacuum Skyforce engine on the second stage and a pressure fed kick stage. Their engines are a unique closed-ish cycle. They'll be using basically a monoprop to spin the pumps, so decomposed peroxide, much like the RD-107 and RD-108 on the Soyuz. But instead of dumping it overboard, they're gonna be piping that right back into the main chamber. So it's technically closed cycle, but not staged combustion cycle. Something cool, I've never seen that done before, so I thought that was pretty awesome. But we don't really know anything else about the Skyroar XL, so we'll be watching out for them closely too. And lastly, we have to talk about the rocket launching launch company, Launcher. No wait, rocket, rocket launching company, Launcher. There we go. They're working on a rocket called Rocket One. <laughs> so yes. Rocket One is going to be launched by Launcher. <laughs> this will never get confusing. Besides having a handful of exciting contracts and very healthy funding, the most exciting thing to me is they're pursuing a closed cycle oxygen rich Carolox engine called, wait for it, Engine 2 or just E2. This thing is incredible. It can hit 365 seconds of specific impulse in a vacuum, which is amazing. It's 3D printed and the main chamber and the nozzle are copper alloy, which just simply looks awesome. Now they don't have a launch pad picked out yet and we don't really know when we can expect to see them fly, but they have a lot of potential and I just really want to see that E2 engine fly. That thing looks amazing. Okay, so those are some of the vehicles I just had to mention quickly that didn't make the cut for this video, but 
Hopefully they continue to mature and get out to the launch pad soon because I wanna see all of them fly. But for now, it's on to our main features. Let's start off with a familiar launch vehicle, Rocket Lab's Electron Rocket. The Electron is one of the only small lift launchers actively flying to date with their first launch attempt in 2017, which was going very smoothly until a ground tracking station lost track of the rocket and the mission had to be terminated. But they ended up successfully reaching orbit on their second attempt less than a year later, which proved the rocket's flight worthiness. The Electron has a few features that are super unique and it even sports a few rocketry firsts. The body is entirely made out of carbon composites with no separate liner or anything. All carbon fiber, baby. This makes it very lightweight and very strong. It also uses electric pump fed engines called the Rutherford. Electric pump fed is a simple design that uses powerful motors to spin the pumps that pulls the propellant from the tanks and forces them into the combustion chamber at high pressures. The Rutherfords are also 3D printed, which for a rocket engine this size makes a ton of sense. There are nine sea level Rutherfords on the first stage and a single vacuum optimized Rutherford on the upper stage, which also runs on RP1 and liquid oxygen, otherwise known as Carolox. The Electron launches from either LC-1A or soon LC-1B on the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. And then there's also Mars Pad 0C at Wallops, Virginia, that Rocket Lab actually calls LC-2. So we haven't seen them fly from there yet, but hopefully it's gonna fly there really soon. Another fun note about Rocket Lab is that they're technically an American aerospace company, but founded in New Zealand with a wholly owned New Zealand subsidiary who is now actually publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And full disclosure, I am a proud shareholder. By being a US company with US headquarters, they found a great way to make it so they could fly NASA and US military payloads really easily. And they could also develop the avionics and engines in the US. But one of the most exciting things about the Electron is Rocket Lab is actively pursuing reusing it. Now I've done a video on this topic, why their plans to use just a parachute and a helicopter should work, and why SpaceX or other companies don't do something more similar to this. As of the making of this video, they've successfully recovered two electrons and reused some of the parts of the first recovered rocket. And I have no doubt that we'll see a fully recovered and reused electron in the near future. One more detail about Rocket Lab's electron is it has a third stage and that third stage can do a lot, including sending payloads to the moon or even to Venus. They have a basic cold gas kick stage with a tiny little engine called the Curie engine to circularize their orbits, or they have a full-blown photon spacecraft with a hypercurie that can be bipropellant and they can even extend the tanks for maximum performance. Okay, so that's Rocket Lab. Next. The next small lift launcher to make it into orbit, and on our list, is Virgin Orbit with their super unique Launcher 1. Now notice, this isn't Virgin Galactic. It's their sibling company, Virgin Orbit. Virgin Galactic for now is only suborbital space tourism, using their White Knight 2 mothership aircraft and their spaceship to rocket plane. Virgin Orbit is different, although kind of the same. It's a similar idea by using a 747 as a carrier vehicle that essentially acts like a portion of the first stage by getting the rocket high up and into the upper atmosphere. And then it also gives it some initial velocity. Now, the truth of the matter is because of how little velocity is actually put into the rocket itself, the 747 assist is less of a first stage and more of a flying launch pad. Now, of course, it still has its advantages, like being able to fly and launch above or around adverse weather conditions, or fly to exact inclinations for maximum performance. It also allows them to utilize a more vacuum optimized engine on the first stage, which also increases performance. Someday I'll make a video about air launching and why more companies aren't doing it, because on the surface, it makes a ton of sense to give the rocket a little boost but there definitely are some reasons why it might not be worth it for most engineers and most systems. Pros and cons, my friends, it's all about those fun engineering compromises. 
But back to the system. The 747 is a 400 series named Cosmic Girl, which was originally in Virgin Airlines fleet. A 747 was chosen for a few really, really good reasons. First off, it's readily available. There's thousands of experienced and trained pilots, engineers, mechanics, and parts readily available. But another fun reason is the 747 was actually designed to hold a fifth engine under its left wing for transporting engines around the world. Now, this pylon had to be modified to handle the weight of the rocket and to drop the rocket <laughs> mid-air, of course, but the plane was already designed to handle similar loads from the get-go. So that's very cool. The rocket itself is a two-stage Carolox rocket with a single open cycle engine called Newton 3 on its first stage and a single open cycle vacuum optimized engine called the Newton 4 on the second stage. One fun little note is the roll of the rocket is controlled by the exhaust from the gas generator, which is always something I thought was a really cool idea after I first learned about it from the RS-68 that's on the Delta IV. Just like Rocket Lab's launch history, Virgin Orbit followed a similar fate with their first launch, which happened in 2020. The rocket had a clean drop from the carrier plane, but the rocket failed shortly after main engine ignition. But they successfully made it into orbit on their second launch attempt in January 2021. They're now operational and ready for more commercial launches. Astra's rocket is what would happen if you combined the old school looks of the Atlas Convair SM65A rocket with Rocket Lab's Electron, kind of, and then launched it from one of the most gorgeous launch sites in the world in Kodiak, Alaska. Astra's rocket used to be called Rocket 3 and was following a number scheme of 3.0, 3.1, 3.2 for each launch, etc., etc. But Astra actually told me to just simply call it Astra's rocket, likely because they're still evolving so quickly that that numbering scheme just doesn't really make sense. So our facts and numbers do reflect what Astra told us and might not necessarily reflect previous Rocket 3 series. Astra was a quiet little rocket company who was located in Alameda, California, which is just across the bay from San Francisco. They were actually known as the Stealth Space Company for a while until they started test launches. Astra's launch services are a low cost, highly portable solution. One of their most unique features is their ability to fit inside of a standard shipping container and have all of the launch infrastructure also be able to be shipped via shipping containers. These containers can then be loaded into a C-130 and then taken to launch sites around the world. This adds a rapid response capability. Like the other rockets we've talked about so far in this video, it also runs on Carolox on both stages. The first stage has five of their Delphin engines, which like the Electron are electric pump fed and 3D printed. And the upper stage has a single ether pressure fed engine. So far there have been three test launches and they were able to demonstrate orbital capability, but they haven't quite made it to orbit to date. Their most recent launch attempt in December, 2020 made it past the Kármán line and even to their target orbital altitude of 390 kilometers, but failed to reach a stable orbit when it fell just 500 meters per second short of orbit due to a bad fuel mixture ratio in the upper stage. The company announced plans to become publicly traded in February of 2021 through a special purchase acquisition company, or SPAC. Now again, full disclosure, I'm also a proud shareholder, because I like rockets. Astro is raring to go with 10 plus customers, including Planet and NASA, ready to go in the next few years. Astro is also exploring other launch sites as part of their spaceport strategy. They're focusing on a complete turnkey launch solution. So call them up and they will launch your payload efficiently and affordably. It feels like they're putting a lot of extra effort into the customer facing side, which is probably a good thing now with so many new customers hitting the market. Firefly's Alpha is a rocket that kind of slipped by me a bit. I think it was a bit confusing to me because the original company, Firefly Space Systems, went bankrupt, and then it got a whole new round of funding and emerged as Firefly Aerospace. And when this switchover happened, they dropped their original Firefly Alpha Aerospike powered small lift launcher, which, oh, that was cool, it was cool. But they ended up completely starting over with a new rocket, still called Alpha, but this is basically an entirely new rocket. So fast forward to today and the company has an orbit ready rocket on the launch pad. And may I say, 
I think this is one of the coolest looking rockets I've ever seen. I love that paint job. Just like the Electron, Alpha is made entirely from carbon composite tanks, but Alpha is a much larger rocket. In fact, Alpha is the largest carbon composite rocket that will fly to date. Again, like every other rocket here so far, Alpha runs on Carolox, but its engines are doing something very unique. They run on the tap-off cycle, which is where you basically just punch a hole in the side of your combustion chamber and then have that high pressure gas spin the turbine to turn your pumps. It's a cycle type that has never flown on an orbital rocket and Firefly will be using them on both stages. There's four Reaver engines on the first stage and a single Lightning engine on the upper stage. Firefly is based out of Austin, Texas, which is where their headquarters are, but they actually build and test their hardware about 80 kilometers northwest of Austin. They'll be launching Alpha from Slick 2W in Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, where their first Alpha is on the pad as of the making of this video, just waiting to fly. Next up, we have ABL Space Systems with their RS-1 rocket. ABL is focusing on trying to make the most simple and cost-effective rocket ever made. Like the others, it also runs on Carolox. And like most of the other rockets here, the engines they're using are 3D printed. Their E2 engines are open cycle. There's that familiar nine engines on the first stage and a single vacuumized E2 engine on the second stage. I think one of the standout features of ABL, kind of similar to Astra, is that they can launch really from anywhere. ABL just packs up their entire launch infrastructure in standard shipping containers. And when I say everything, I mean absolutely everything. Their integrated mobile launch system is called GS0, which stands for something, something, something. We couldn't actually find it quoted anywhere but I would assume it's probably something like ground system zero. Maybe it's my love of tiny homes and shipping container houses that makes me love these shipping container concepts. It's cool to think you could just ship the systems anywhere with a concrete pad and have a launch pad in your own backyard if you wanted to. But what's important for commercial and government customers is they can operate from all FAA licensed sites. So all the sites we're familiar with in the United States and even including one in Camden County, Georgia. Like so many of the other companies in this group, ABL is based out of California, specifically El Segundo, which is right next to Hawthorne. A lot of the rockets we're talking about today are using 3D printing for a lot of parts and even engines, but none are taking 3D printing quite as far as relativity. Relativity is literally trying to 3D print the entire rocket. Yeah, like all of it. That's right, their Terran 1 rocket is pretty much entirely 3D printed. The fuselage and all. They're trying to reduce the number of parts by 100 times. This greatly simplifies manufacturing, reduces part lead time, simplifies the supply chain, and theoretically increases reliability. And just look at how big their 3D printer called Stargate is. It's actually one of the world's largest 3D printers ever made. This allows Relativity to make unique shapes and designs, but it also allows them to quickly make changes to their designs since they don't have to really change any tooling. The first stage of the Terran 1 has nine Eon 1 engines and the upper stage has a single vacuum optimized Eon engine. The Eons are open cycle and run on liquid natural gas and liquid oxygen. A fun note about this rocket is they're planning to use autogenous pressurization to backfill the tanks, much like the Space Shuttle's external fuel tank or Starship, which removes the need for expensive and hard to manage helium in the system. Relativity is based out of Long Beach and Los Angeles, California, where their headquarters and factories are located, but they'll be launching the Terran 1 from LC-16 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, and they also have a site picked out at Vandenberg as well. Okay, so that's our list of current and upcoming small lift launchers. How do they compare against each other, and are any of them making improvements over what SpaceX accomplished over 10 years ago with their Falcon 1? Okay, my friends, it's time we line these babies up side by side. So let's do just that so we can get a sense of how big each rocket really is. For being small lift launchers, some of these rockets are getting pretty big. 
Terran 1, for example, is actually about half the height of SpaceX's Falcon 9. Next up, their width. Again, Alpha and Terran 1 are pretty big rockets, much bigger than I think most people might realize. But the one thing that's kind of surprising here is Launcher 1. It's probably because when you see a picture of it attached to a massive 747, it looks like a little rinky-dinky missile or something. But then when you see people next to it, you realize it's indeed a surprisingly big rocket. Okay, now let's show each rocket's thrust, the cycle type, and specific impulse of the first two stages, and whether or not they have a kick stage. Maybe more important than their sizes and payload fairing volume is how much can these vehicles actually put into orbit. For these numbers, we're going to look at how much they can lift to Sun Synchronous Orbit, or SSO, which is a number we could get an accurate quote on from each company. This is similar to a polar orbit and takes more energy to get into than just a low inclination orbit. Astra's rocket, although tiny, it's a very capable small lift launcher. But the other outlier here is the RS-1. It's the payload leader, but it's not even the biggest rocket. So now the price. And again, we should take some of these numbers with a little grain of salt because some of these are just rough quotes the companies have published. But in general, this seems to be about the lowest cost for most of these companies, or maybe even like a starting point for a dedicated ride. So don't actually put too much weight on these numbers. And also the Falcon 1 is adjusted for today's dollar. As far as just a base price, if you totally had to book a ride all on your own and have a satellite under 500 kilograms, it'd be hard to beat Astra's price. But then again, we don't actually know what it'd cost for the full 500 kilograms. That 2.5 million is likely just a starting point for a much lighter payload. But one thing's for sure, you cannot discount Rocket Lab's orbital launch experience. This is a very serious consideration because flying regularly to orbit is vastly different from some just vague target initial launch. And this is even despite Rocket Lab's recent setback. For now, they're the only ones regularly flying and with a lot of experience under their belt. Now it might be tempting to do a dollar to kilogram ratio here for these rockets, but unfortunately with only knowing the starting point and the maximum payload potential, it just might not be a fair or accurate comparison. But here's a reminder, small lift launchers don't always look great for their dollar to kilogram ratio because you're buying a dedicated ride to space. If your satellite is say 300 kilograms, you would want to purchase the cheapest rocket that can support that, period. So most of the time that dollar to kilogram ratio number is a lot less important than the final amount at the end of the day to launch your satellite. How much are you writing that check for? But as far as how do these compare to the Falcon 1? Well, some are potentially making some improvements, but honestly, others still can't quite keep up with what SpaceX was doing 12 years ago. It's honestly pretty spectacular what SpaceX accomplished in the early days. And had they kept flying Falcon 1, I have no doubt they would have continued making tweaks in performance and price, and it would have been even more competitive by now. Wow, they were honestly super far ahead of the game. So that's how all these rockets compare side by side. So let's get some final thoughts in. Clearly, there's a flood of small sat launchers coming online and competing for a healthy handful of small satellites and CubeSats. But the ultimate question for me is how many of these companies can coexist. In my outside opinion, it feels like there's really only room for about four or maybe five of them to exist based on the current demand of payloads. And at some point, it'll almost be too late to join in a small sat launching game unless you have some big radical breakthrough that makes you super ultra competitive somehow. At the end of the day, one thing we need to keep in mind is there are definitely advantages to going bigger. There's a lot of launch operation costs that are just simply fixed costs, like range and safety, personnel time, and a few things that don't increase linearly with the size of the vehicle. As in launching a Falcon 9 that could launch, say, 50 times that of a small sat launcher likely doesn't require 50 times the amount of people to operate it. So there's always some benefits to just simply being larger that small lift launchers can't overcome. But the fact that you could book a ride for your small satellite and be flying potentially much quicker 
directly to your desired orbit is extremely appealing. I know for those of us who are outside the industry, it can be kind of hard to understand why that's really that important. But for those trying to be first to market with a new satellite or a new concept, getting a ride to prove out your technology in a hurry is actually a huge, huge deal. But as far as which of these companies do I think will be around in 10 years? Well, I wanna think all of them might be, but that's maybe a little bit unrealistic. In fact, until a company is flying and flying regularly, there's just so much risk involved in developing and launching. But I think Rocket Lab has proven to be a solid player with plenty of demand and clearly a system set up for rapid launch cadence. I fully expect they'll be around long term and I'm excited for them to get into the medium lift launchers with their Neutron rocket. Personally, I'm very excited about Terran 1 being 3D printed but that also seems like a fairly risky endeavor since it's utilizing 3D printing at a new, never before done scale. But if they can pull it off, it might be a pretty massive disruptor. I really like Launcher 1 because I think air launching is cool, but of course that's not reason enough. I also think there's some payloads that will almost require Launcher 1, including payloads that they'll want to integrate on site or you know, not ship it across the world first before they integrate it onto the rocket. Or there's also the option for the Launcher 1 to fly to another country and launch from there, which might be appealing for some payloads. I think Firefly's Alpha is a real solid contender, especially if you need more performance, and the fact that they have a rocket on the launch pad as we speak makes them a step ahead of a few others in this comparison. I personally think if you can get your rocket operational this year, you'll be here to stay but the race is still on until you're regularly and reliably flying. I mean, just look at Astra, who has gotten so close to orbit, or Rocket Lab, who is very experienced, but just saw an unexpected failure on their 20th mission. Spaceflight is hard. It really is. It takes a lot of perfection to do regularly. And these small sat launchers are often riding on a very, very thin margin for what's even physically possible but something about that just makes them even cooler to me. Small lift launch vehicles, tiny, but awesome. I hope the best for all of these companies and any other aspiring company working on getting their first rocket to the pad. I feel like you need to be extra creative and extra plucky to make a small lift launcher work. So cheers to all of you trying. So what do you think? Do you think any of these launchers stand out? Are there any that you're really excited about in particular? Which ones do you think will still be here in 10 years? I mean, of course, I hope all of them are. But maybe the biggest question, do you think small sat launchers are here to stay? Or do you think bigger rideshare options will ultimately just win out? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks to Casper Stanley for the awesome 3D rocket renders. As always, his work is amazing. Find him on Twitter, find his YouTube channel, and find his Rocket Explorer app on the Steam store. And we also need to thank the sponsor of this video, KiwiCo. KiwiCo makes amazing hands-on projects and toys designed to expose kids to concepts in Steam. So science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Personally, I wish KiwiCo was around when I was a kid because I was always building things, constantly tinkering and playing with things around the house. But I almost never had the right materials to finish my little projects or ideas, and I was always making a mess or losing my dad's tools. Sorry, Dad. KiwiCo is a monthly crate sent to your door that comes with all the supplies needed right in the box to make awesome projects. Not only that, they have eight subscription lines, so each catering to different age groups and topics. They come fully loaded with really clear and kid-friendly instructions and an educational magazine filled with content to learn even more about the crate's theme. So not only is it fun, it's also engaging and educational. So win, win, win. Now I'm not gonna lie, I saw this robotic arm online and I just had to play with it. <laughs> when I was growing up, I wanted to be a, well, first I wanted to be a tractor, which is not really something you can be when you grow up. And then I wanted to be a scorpion trainer, which may have been a good career. Uh, but for a long time, actually, for most of my childhood, I wanted to be a prosthetic and robotic engineer. So this, uh, this is definitely like hitting the feels for me. This is really cool. And I'm really glad that I got a chance to play with this. You can get 50% off your first month of any crate by going to kiwico.com slash everyday astronaut. There is a link below in the description as well. So thank you to Kiwico for sponsoring this video. I owe a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for helping make content like this and 
everything else that we do here at Everyday Astronaut possible. If you want to get exclusive access to behind the scenes streams or our amazing Discord channel and community, or even just get your thoughts and comments on scripts and videos before they come out, head on over to patreon.com slash Everyday Astronaut. Thank you. And while you're online, be sure and check out our awesome web store for shirts like this, the Aerospike shirt, which is not only one of my favorite engines, it's also one of my favorite shirts. But browse around, there's lots of really cool stuff, and we finally got our full flow stage combustion cycle hoodies back in stock. So there's tons of cool stuff, and just shop around, maybe grab something for yourself or a friend, and show your support for the channel by going to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.